Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody can, can hear me loud and clear. Um, welcome, everyone, to tonight's Livery Committee Literary Cocktail Hour with past master Christopher McCain. Um, it's, 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 I'm delighted to welcome so many. We've got almost 100 people booked for the call tonight, so that's fantastic. Perhaps it's a good opportunity also for me to remind you of what the Livery Committee's objectives are. Um, firstly, number one objective is to represent the views of, of the membership, which, which Peter Day does so well. Second is to raise uh, money to support the wonderful work of the Stationers Foundation. And thirdly, which is what we're doing tonight, is to organise social events that appeal to, to all our membership. And um, last year we started an initiative, which we hope will continue, which is an ongoing series of, of, of literary lunches. Um, these intend to be informal occasions away from the hall where we can meet with authors that are actually associated with the company and we can hear about both their publications and their lives. Um, some of you, in fact 45 of you were at Williamson's Tavern in October where we were entertained by Simon Heffer but subsequently we've had to postpone uh, the event with Angela Clark in March. Angela's a former Young Station of the Year. Uh, but we've still got Margaret, who's on the call tonight. Margaret Wills booked in for the September the 10th. And we'll have to confirm whether that's going to be a virtual event or actually we can, we can go to a, a location. But all these events, we, the members that attend, they have the opportunity to purchase um, a signed book by the author. And tonight we'll also have that opportunity at the end. So um, tonight is not a literary lunch, but it's a cocktail hour. So charge your glasses, sit back and enjoy a cocktail hour with Christopher in conversation with livery representative and BBC veteran Peter Day. So Peter, over to you. Thank you, Mike. We're talking about this handsome and illuminating book, The Thunderer, which represents eight years of work by Christopher McCain, known to everybody, of course, who's zoomed in this evening. Christopher retired nine years ago from The Times, a lifetime in Fleet Street, eight years at the Independent, 30 years at the Times, where he did all sorts of jobs and then ended up as um, uh, deputy managing edi a deputy editor. He then embarked on his first book, The Thunderer, the biographer of John Walter II, the son of the founder of the Times, and for 44 years, the controller of the newspaper, a hugely influential man, a hugely influential newspaper. Um, Christopher has now been appointed historian of the time, so as at least one more book is in the offing. He's going to tell us about John Walter, but also, I hope, his own life and times in what used to be Fleet Street and about the stationers, which, of course, we're now locked out of because of the plague. We'll try to end around seven o'clock, and I've got some, a few questions I can ask on your behalf as well, nearer the end. Now, welcome, Christopher, from another part of Islington. I want to start off with a pressing question about lockdown. You're a beekeeper, and this must be the most tremendous spring and early summer for bees. And London bees are actually absolutely in clover, aren't they? They have far more flowers to choose from than any country bee. It's a wonderful place to make honey, isn't it? It's been a very good start to the year. Actually, our bees are up on our allotments in East Finchley, very close to the St Pancras uh, burial ground. Lots of flowers there, or quite a few plastic. But uh, the bees are going great guns. I've got one hive which is looking really prosperous. I've got another nucleus due to be delivered in a couple of days or so. So I'm hopeful of good harvest this year. And all sorts of flower flavours, so the depth of uh, London honey is uh, fantastic, isn't it? It is. It's very difficult. One year mine tasted a mint, another year something else. It's hard to tell, but it's a great mix. And of course, being on allotments, there are a lot of vegetable flowers as well, you know, beans and peas and so on. How long have you done this for? Well, the beekeeping is since I, when I retired from the Times, my colleagues gave me a beehive and a bee suit and a smoker and so on, and I was off. What a fantastic. So that's nine years. Fantastic retirement present. Now, the book, this book, The Thunder, is big, comprehensive, wonderfully illustrated, and with an awful lot of research in it. What's it like going from the day, day to day, hurly-burly of newspapers 
to this kind of uh, long-term big stuff research? Well, it was long-term because I, I had no deadline, of course. You know, my working life was a production journalist and a deadline every night. But this was not the case at all. I just started off. I wrote for a week or so. I'd stop. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and come downstairs. So there was no, there was no pressing need to finish it until eventually, I did try it on a couple of publishers, then I showed it to past master Noel Osborne, and he said, you know, I would like to publish this with Philemore, his imprint, and then I did have to get cracking a bit and finish it off, and Index is a real bore, and of course I also did all the picture research myself. But, but, but you could do it, you could move from hurly-burly daily stuff to this long-term thing mentally all right, could you? Very, very easily. I mean, I had a lovely career at the times, but I was absolutely ready to retire at 65. And this was a hobby, the book, and then it sort of gathered speed a bit. And now, of course, I'm on another book. <laughs> Let's get on to The Thunder itself, a newspaper, The Times, immersed in tradition. Uh, it first appeared as the Daily Universal Register, January the 1st, 1785. Were there things that surprised you, even though you'd worked there so long, um, when you started researching the history? I suppose what really came through with John Walter II was the way the paper kept inquiring and looking for new stories. It spent money on foreign correspondence. And of course, as the title, the red, first title, the register, it was striving to be a newspaper record. That's a dreadful burden to be saddled with. I and mean, I don't think any paper now could be described as a paper of record, but the Times was, and it, it, it did, as I say, really strive to cover an enormous amount of news of a great variety. And, and of course, John, that it achieved uh, from John Walter being there so long and wanting to do it like that, was it? It was a, it was a personal thing. It was, and I think well, you showed the picture of him on the front of the book. He's a very austere man. Um, he's not, you know, he's not sort of your average newspaper for us nowadays. Uh, but he was a man of, with terrific principles and a head for business. And his obituary, when he died in the paper, said he understood the popular temper. And that was the thing. He understood his readers. You might also add, of course, he was the proprietor. So he didn't have to understand the temper of the proprietor. That helps an awful lot, I think. But there were an awful lot of newspapers around at the time. For, for the Times to emerge in this way wasn't just the fact they were embracing the new technology right back at the beginning with this ex extraordinary and not very effective way of setting type. Yeah, I mean, the launch issue was a halfpenny cheaper. He, uh, John Walter the I undercut all the other newspapers, so he launched at a lower price. He had attractive advertising rates, and the paper just took off. It was a slow build, the circulation. I mean, it started at about 1,000. Uh, by about 1,800, it's only 2,000. And then you get a tremendous surge from about 1817 or so to 7,000. Three years later, it's 15,000. And on and on it went, and it quite soon became by far the biggest single circulation paper. And of course there's an awful awful lot of social history in general, not just about newspapers in this, because newspapers are actually at the heart of this technology revolution, uh, transport, the, the increasing concentration of people in cities, education, all these things were powering newspapers throughout the 19th century, weren't they? Yes, it was to begin with a very limited circulation, pretty much within the city of London. And then it spread out. And of course, copies were sold on at a penny a time. So each newspaper was probably read eight or nine or 10 times, particularly in coffee houses. And then, of course, when you've got the advent of the railways, you can really distribute the paper much more efficiently and swiftly. And the ones that have already been read eight or nine times were then sold sold on to country readers, weren't they? Yeah, and they, yes, they were terribly tacky by then. 
because quite a lot of country readers couldn't actually read, so people would have the paper read to them in groups. It would take a hell of a long time. There were a lot of words in the paper. Small type and a lot of... Uh, Parliament was very important and then foreign news came in because uh, John Walter too saw that as a, a, a thing that he particularly wanted to do. Well, also, you see, the paper was getting off the ground during the Napoleonic Wars, you know, 1803 to 15, and tremendous appetite for news about the war. It's the same now, there's always a circulation spike when there's a good war going on. And he certainly capitalized on that. Um, and all the time, new technology, a sort of theme of the times for um, 200 years. Yes, I mean, the, the, steam, the steam presses that he brought in were possibly his most revolutionary innovation. I should say Walter was a qualified printer. He'd done, he was a master printer. He'd done a seven-year apprenticeship. And in 1810, he broke a strike. His men walked out. He gathered half a dozen other people and so that he could do everything. And he, again, his obituary says the proprietor worked incessantly at case and press. And he brought the paper out. And on Monday, the striker thought, hold on, there's not going to be a paper today. And blow me, it came out for several months. And then they trickled back to work. He could do everything, John was the second. So uh, pre-echoes of what happened at the Times much, much later in its career. Yeah, I mean, the, the big breakthrough, the steam presses in 1814, the Koenig and Bauer presses that Walter bought and had built in secret at the back of the building. And that enabled him to one night, he, he was ready to go, and he told his printers to stand by, we're waiting for late news from the continent. And then two or three hours later, he came into the press hall and he said, the Times is already printed by steam. And they knew they'd been outflanked, lost their jobs, and been defeated by the proprietor, effectively. We had all this again in 1986. It is an extraordinary prefiguring of that, the same um, sleight of hand almost. It really was because the 86 move to Wapping, nobody really knew what, very few people knew what was happening uh, before they actually went down there on the night when we moved to Wapping. You're now charged with taking the history of the times up to date, aren't you? So that's a, um, uh, that's a rather different job from, from this one concentrating on one man, or is it? It is very different. Um, <laughs> I think one of the difficulties is, is that everybody is still alive. So a lot of people are going to read this and think, hold on a minute, I'm not sure about that. There's a great attraction of working with archive material and not having anyone to answer back. On the other hand, I've got a lot of people I can speak to and people I know and worked with on the paper. And that's, that's the fun of it. I mean, I was asked to do this because the editor felt that you know, people knew me, I knew the paper, and he hoped it would come out fairly and represent the paper fairly. So what period are you looking at then? I'm going from 2002, which is when Peter Stottard finished his editorship, so Robert Thompson arrives, and then I'm going up to the present day. So I have three editors, Robert Thompson, James Harding, and now John Witherer. And you won't have that, that year when the Times was, uh, uh, was off the streets. No, I mean, that was a very strange year. And of course, it broke Roy Thompson's heart when the papers stopped for a year. I mean, he paid, we were all paid our full salaries and we came back and the National Union of Journalists slapped in a pay claim and then went on strike for a week. I mean, it was... It was outrageous, and very soon after that, he sold to Rupert Murdoch. Roy Thompson is a very remarkable person in newspaper history in Britain, always rather sneered at because he was so commercial, but my goodness, he, uh, he did a lot, and he was almost bankrupt at the age of 40, wasn't he? Yes, well, it, well you know, hopefully Rupert Murdoch has run very close to the wire <laughs> on, on finances. But yeah, I mean, I think we viewed Roy Thompson as a very benevolent proprietor. 
it seemed to me that whenever we put in a pay claim, he said, fine, I'm proud to own the Times, I'll give it to you. <laughs> but in the end, he, he just had enough of it. And his son, Kenneth Thompson, was not interested. His heart wasn't in his eye. But so the papers went up for sale, a little bidding war, and Rupert Murdoch won. The imprint of the proprietor has been very heavy on the Times for, um, well, two centuries really, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is that a secret of success? I think what the two proprietors I've worked for, Roy Thompson and Murdoch, have both bankrolled the paper through its darkest days. You know, the paper, the Times has never made money until very recently. When I showed people round, I used to say uh, proudly, the Times not for profit since 1785. And that was the case. We lost money and the proprietors kept pumping money in. Why did they do it? Because they felt a great pride in the paper. I had a chat with Rupert Murdoch just before Christmas and I said to him, which of all the titles all around the world of yours, which, which are you proudest of? And he just said, this one, picking up the Times. And he has kept faith with the paper and pumped money in. Now, of course, the paper is in profit. Which is a rather remarkable thing to be at this particular stage in newspaper history. It certainly is. And last year's profit was 3.4 million. The Sun, on the other hand, lost 68 million. And this is why Rebecca Brooks told the staff last week, we're going to make a lot of cuts in jobs, but also move closer to convergence of the two times titles. Now, that's something that was not allowed under the original deeds of sale. And then about a year ago, the government said that Murdoch could converge the papers to some extent. And that is what is happening. Several sections are now jointly run seven days a week across the two titles. And, and the outlook for the newspaper industry is uh, pretty grim at the moment. I mean, there's this sort of temporary thing, which may not be temporary, of, uh, of COVID and people staying at home and circulations dropping and no advertising coming in. Um, that may pick up when uh, people start moving about again. But the industry as a whole is in terrible trouble, isn't it? It is. I mean, the big problem at the moment, I think, is advertising has fallen off the edge of a cliff, obviously. There's nothing there, and particularly for The Sun, where the bulk of their advertising is big full-page ads for supermarkets and betting on the back pages and so on. That's disappeared completely. The Times advertising has held up reasonably well, but nonetheless, it, they are these are difficult days. They really are. And, of course, it all... Well, in the case of the Times and the Sunday Times, bringing the two titles together, there will be economies of scale. I hope the papers retain their identities, and I think they will. But of course, digital is quite a lot cheaper to produce if you cut some corners, and the switch to digital is a major, major factor now, obviously. But it's not cheaper when you have to produce print at the same time or alongside digital. The, the Guardian dilemma, of course, seeing digital very clearly, but also rooted in, use in, in, in print production. Running two horses is, is even more expensive than running one, isn't it? It is. But on the other hand, the presses that the Times has, which were brought about or oh, 15 years ago now, are still running very well, and they are doing a hell of a lot of contract printing. You know, they're not just printing declining numbers of the Times and Sunday Times and Sun. They're contracted to print a lot of other newspapers as well. So those keep churning it out, and I think they will continue. We, our readership is still, well, it's pretty evenly split between people who read on screen and people who want print. And there are 300,000 digital-only subscriptions now, and that's actually now crept ahead of print subscriptions and will continue to rise. But is the appetite for 
for the written word, the, the word on paper, there anymore? Is it inculcated in children? They don't, do they see their parents reading? I mean, it, it's something you learn at a fairly early stage of the game, isn't it? It is, but our daughters, for example, most of the time would read the paper online, no question about that, but they're still reading the Times, you know. It's still the same product, they're still the same words, it's just a different vehicle to get it to the readers. So the problem is the one of um, making money out of the digital product. Monetizing, that's what it's all about, yes. I mean, to begin with, the advertising for, for Times Online was absolutely non-existent. But that has picked up, it is doing better. And I mean, the Times is now stepping into radio. You know, we're launching Times Radio in about a month's time, which will be very interesting. And I'm not quite clear how that is going to be monetized. Because it's, I'm assuming it's going to be ads. Is the whole thing in me free? I don't know. I thought it was going to, but anyway. Um, okay. It could be, could be could, that newspapers were just a sort of temporary phase. There were just a 200 years of newspapers, which the Times wrote out. And now we go over to something quite different because that's what younger readers want. Um, we may have lived through the newspaper era altogether, may we not? Well, yeah, but what's the alternative? It's reading tweets from President Trump and fake news. I mean, you know, I think there's got to be some sort of standard of reporting and pride in getting facts right and helping people to make up their own opinions unless we're just going to divorce ourselves from, from the real world but it may need quite an ingenious way of re-establishing those principles. Um, the gatekeeper principle, for example, which has been so founded on the ownership of presses or the ownership of, of stage, television stations, now is, through Twitter and Facebook, um, access to a vast audience is there for anybody, isn't it? Yes, it is. I think this may be what Rebecca Brooks means when she says we're going to have to reset the business. There may be some crafty plans going on there. But, you know, I think there's still an appetite for words. That, that will surely be with us for many years yet. Well, I'm 73. I mean, it doesn't matter with me. <laughs> Why did you go into journalism in the first place? Oh, I mean, I thought I did rather fall into it. I had, I was very keen on the Foreign Office and I didn't get, uh, get off of anything there. And I went to see the University Appointments Board and they said, there's a job going on the local paper, the Oxford Times. And I thought, well, okay, might as well have a look at that. You know what undergraduates are like, you know, I thought, oh, okay, I have a shock at that. Went down there and got taken on as a trainee sub-editor at the Oxford Times. And that's what I've done. I've done a tiny bit of reporting. I'm not happy reporting, really, and grilling people, unlike you. I like making things. And at the end, of, the end of the night, the great thrill is to walk home, bus home, holding the newspaper that you've made. That's, that's what got me. <laughs> But the, the art of the sub-editor is a fading one, isn't it? Don't uh, reporters now, uh, on the whole, produce stuff that gets into the paper as it is? Oh, well, that's the problem. Some of that stuff that goes online is hurled in at great speed because you've got the... Well, you know, we used to have one big heave at about 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening and that was it, you finished. You might do two or three later editions, but that was the end of it. Now you've got rolling news and with online, you've got to update it two, three, four times a day. And some of that stuff is going to be pretty raw copy, I would say. But at the times there are still sub-editors crafting papers and writing headlines. Well, the editor writes a lot of headlines actually. Um, you know, and there is subbing because part of it is the fact that you've got so much news now and so many photos that you have to be very selective, and that's all part of subbing. Now, um, you were there for the, the um, 
the 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 whopping the whopping clash that was what happened when the times moved to washing uh, to whopping was very unpleasant to be part of wasn't it it was and i i think i felt it in some ways more than some other more than reporters might because i worked in the composing room on the stone with a lot of these blokes who were now standing either side of the highway hurling abuse at us as we went into the office i drove in every night through the picket lines and then we drove out well you know late at night one or two in the morning in a police convoy and we were taken out to east london towards stratford before we were allowed to disperse and go home and it was very unpleasant but at the back of it all was you had the realization you could actually produce a newspaper because we'd lost so many issues in the run-up to that a, a tiny chapel could stop the paper and you'd worked all afternoon reporters had reported all day and he'd made a paper and then it didn't come out and that was absolutely uh, anathema to me and the way the times got round that with this overnight flip to whopping was an extraordinary coup it really was and it worked we didn't lose an issue of the paper but but it, it was it was bruising it was uh, psychologically bruising for you because you had to go on producing it with the the battle of whopping going on every night yeah i mean some of the reporters from the sun used to go and stand by the bars of the gate and jeer at the picketers but that's his son for you but there were people on the Times, the production editor, Tony Norbury, who did have guards on their houses, and it was very unpleasant for them because they were known to the picketers. And there was some violence. I mean, ill-advised people who went into local pubs found that, uh, you know, they could get into an argument, and it, it was not at all pleasant. But as I say, the paper kept coming out and that was the important thing and some of these the young printers some of them saw this coming and they moved away they got other jobs you know selling car number plates and things but the ones who really stuck it out as hard as they could were, they were riding for a fall and i'm mean, sorry to say dear baroness dean was leading them in that you know and it was not it was never going to work out for them once the paper had come out the first night that was it well brenda dean was what well, it was in opposition to what you were were doing there wasn't she yes she was yeah i mean um, she would say she talked to murdoch a lot but the trouble is you know a head of a union is beholden to the membership and she just, you know, the members were intransigent. But later on, you were there on the court of the stationers company with, with Brenda Dean. Yes, a lovely woman. I was astonished when she became a stationer. Quite different, you know, we remember the fiery redhead sort of whipping Sogath up and giving Rupert Murdoch a very hard time. She was great on the court because, because she, uh, she's in the House of Lords by then. And um, a very good, yeah, I mean, yeah, she became Baroness in 1993, I think. But she was a very good member of the court, very wise, sensible headed, and so sorry when she died so young, actually. It was a great pity. I've got a question that uh, Martin Woodhead has sent in um, about the Times and the FT. There was a merger proposed at some stage. Uh, which never happened. Why didn't it happen? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, proprietors are always thinking about mergers. I mean, when I was on The Independent, Andreas Whittam Smith had a crackpot plan to buy the Times for one week. You know, these things are always going along. I suppose the FT and the Times would be reasonable bedfellows, but it would yeah, I think it would, you know, I'm very keen on the plurality of the press. It would diminish both papers. The FT has got a very big staff, I must say. Much smaller, bigger than the Times. It's also had a remarkable success in digitising what it does too. Um, 
uh, yeah. and going into America, which uh, it looked just a late arrival for America 10 years ago, and it's done very, very well indeed. But there is always going to be a market for business information. And Robert Thompson saw that, you know, that, that you can sell business information much more easily than you can sell stories about, I don't know, Madeleine McCann. You know, it's a, it's, that's a different sort of market. And you have to try to appeal to very broad readership these days. What was the high spot of your career? Well, joining the Times was pretty good. It was good. Actually, I mean, I think the, in, the Independent was the most exciting time because to be part of a launch of a new national newspaper, which hadn't happened for many, many years, and one that did so wonderfully well. We had a lot of journalists from the Times and the Sunday Times, and you know, we overtook the Times circulation. Simon Jenkins spoke to his staff. He said, the Times have parked their tanks on our lawn, and we were really pleased about that. I mean, the paper did wonderfully well at the beginning, and then just sort of the Sunday paper finished it, really. Andreas, I'm afraid, was overcome by proprietorial megalomania and wanted a Sunday paper, and it never worked. But gosh, we had fun at the beginning. It was great. What about low points in your career? Well, I suppose being fired from the independent. <laughs> Although, truth to tell, the paper was not doing all that well then, and we'd had many changes of editor. I don't think we really knew where we were going. I think the most fun you have on a paper is when you know you're making a paper for people like yourself and you understand the readers. And I think we lost our way there. Uh, we lost revenue from advertising. We overreached on the Sunday paper. I must say being picture editor of The Independent was a real high spot for me. That was because fantastic. Because it took pictures so seriously. We took, Andreas was very keen. I had a huge budget. I had about eight staff photographers, access to masses of freelancers. When I took over as picture editor, my predecessor, Alan John, said to me, you know, Chris, you're going to love this. It's the best fun you can have with your trousers on. <laughs> and it was. It was. It was wonderful. And when, when I left the Independent, honestly, it was a shadow of itself. And I was back on the Times, I think, three or four days later. There is nothing like the old Fleet Street working on a newspaper where the presses roll at, what, nine o'clock uh, and the building shakes a little bit and you, this, this, this cycle of news and news production is uh, a human, a very, very moving human thing, isn't it? Oh, and you're so right. To take a paper straight off the press, slightly damp, um, this, I love the smell of a press hall. It's just great. I love the smell of the ink and all that. I'm very romantic about that sort of aspect of the paper. And also, again, for sub-editor, you know, to take home a paper is, well, you know, you felt you really had a good day's work. Um, With the independent, the independent became what the marketing people were pleased to call a badge product. You know, people wanted to be seen carrying the independent and that slogan it is are you caught it perfectly you know i am independent well, are you you know it was a good slogan that there's another slogan from the times of the what the 50s top people take the times that turned out to be a bit of a mistake in the end didn't it uh, they had the poster up at the house of illustration at uh, king's cross the uh, uh, the other month in an exhibition of george him the uh, uh, the illustrator and uh, caricaturist, and um, uh, it was such a successful slogan. But of course, if you weren't a top person, you didn't take the times and you didn't want to. No, and that was part of the problem. You can't just sell to a few thousand people. And that's, I suppose, where if you're going to push me, we come on to what people perceive to be dumbing down. And I would describe as making the paper more accessible to a broader readership. And the top people thing 
was fine if you were one of that elite, but it was not going to sell papers to very many people, and it didn't. Well, the Diaries of the Jolly Austere paper I have here, this is the <laughs> tiny copy of the, the first edition without advertisements on the front page for 150 years back. I can't even see the date. It was eight, uh, 19... Uh, 1960-something, I'm not sure. 65 yeah. or yeah, something like that, yes. Yeah. Um, so it was a very austere thing, wasn't it? Uh, it's not as austere as that now. So the Times has changed quite a lot in um, uh, the last 50 years, hasn't it? I think the biggest change I've been working on in the first part of the history is the move to the compact paper. You know, and the, the end of the broadsheet. And I have to say, I now find the Sunday Times extremely difficult to read. I can't stretch. I haven't got the wingspan to hold it open. And the compact, I get the letters that I've seen, because I've done a lot of work in the archive. There were three boxes full of letters from readers about the compact. You know, this beastly little rag, you know, this horrible, dumb, it wasn't dumbing down. It was the same content as the broadsheet, for heaven's sake. It just looked, at the, it was a different shape. That's all. Now, of course, the compact was much, much smaller than one of the papers you have in the book. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the picture of the, uh, the man reading an unfolded and unfolded. Waiting for the times, yes. Colossal. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell me about be becoming a stationer. When did you join the stationer's company? Uh, I became, I know I became a liveryman in 1995. So I suppose I was, a, I was probably a freeman for two or three years because Denzel Sharp said, you know, you, you have to be a freeman for a bit. And then well, that's what we say now to people who join. You know, give it a go, see, see what you like it or not and whether it suits you and then go forward to the livery. So I became a liveryman in 1995. Quite serendipitously, it happened that I was a member of the Guild of St. Bride and I used to, I still do even song once, once a month and I used to read a lesson with dear John Waterlow and Herbert Smart, a few members of the company may remember Herbert Smart, Liveryman Herbert Smart, wonderful old Fleet Street stereotyper. And one evening at the end of Even Song, he said, oh, Christopher, why are you not a stationer? And I said, well, nobody's asked me to be a stationer. And so a month later, I found myself at a lunch in the hall, sitting next to Denzel, you know, on his left. And I thought, oh, yes, this is, this is the way the clerk does it. You know, you get someone in and check them out a bit and then see where we go from there. And I, I did go on from there and it's, uh, it's been wonderful. I joined the court in 2000 and sort of progressed from there. And of course it's wonderfully intertwined into, into the book as well, isn't it, The Stationer's Company? Well it is because John Walter II was Master Stationer. It was a very sad mastership for him because he was suffering from cancer he didn't manage to chair all the court meetings of his year, and he did. He died, you know, just about the end of his term. It's very sad. So he didn't make any impression on the company in that sense at all. But for me, that was another good link when I started writing the book. You know, Times, Stationer, Master Stationer, suffering from cancer. It all sort of fitted together rather well. <laughs> you, you have some mouth-watering menus, don't you, in the book, which uh, the stationers' uh, feasts were um, famous, weren't they? Even oh, they the, big, the excesses big, of the big, city big, of London. Big. Yes, uh, a lot of venison was eaten, um, and pies and things, a massive amount of drinking too, I mean, big, big cellar. Uh, it really, <laughs> not so very different from nowadays, but they, the company had a reputation entertaining very well and I'm glad to say I think we've still got that reputation. You were master, you talk about John Walter not making much of an impact, what um, sort of powers does the master actually have? You're there for a year, um, it's, you've got a lot of dining out to do, it's, it's quite a difficult role isn't it? Well it is and it isn't because I think the main role is to 
obviously you're fronting the company when you go out to the other livery companies, but you've basically just got a, it's a big, big livery house, you know, and with the Freeman, we've got a thousand members. It's a very big company. Um, and particularly in court, you've got 30 very opinionated men and women. And I think it's just getting the best out of people. You can't initiate very much when you're master. I mean, if you're going to do something radical, you've probably got to do it when you're under warden or upper warden and then see it through. Because in the year in the chair, he's going to be concerned very much with, you know, just holding the company together and making sure it all works. And get on with the club. Does your waistline expand during the mastership? I, I, I think mine probably did. I mean, but I had a problem with my year as master because I was working full time. And I always said afterwards, I could have given more time to the stationers. And I could have given more time to Rupert Murdoch. It just sort of worked out. And I shuttled between Wapping and Ave Maria Lane. And I, I, I think I just about managed. But it's just the greatest fun. It really is. It's a fabulous year. And to think where well, you are, you know, one in a thousand people to get the chance to do it. And it's just great. Now, the stationers embarking on Vision 350, or rather the bringing out of Vision 350, just when everything is up in the air because of uh, the plague, um, the future is un as, as uncertain as it must have been just after the Great Fire of London when the hall had been burnt. Um, is this the right time for Vision 350, do you think? Well, I think if we don't have the vision now, we're never going to have it. I mean, they, they, going back to the Great Fire, they got some money together, they, they built and they got cracking as hard as they could. And in many ways, the lockdown is presenting us with useful opportunities. You know, there's nobody in the hall. We have got the money to do the stockroom roof and that sort of thing, so we can get on. And it's quite possible nobody would be having a venison feast in the hall until next year, you know, so we might as well crack on and do something, I think, yeah. And it is going to make the whole, it's going to monetize the whole in a much better way, for sure. And that What's matters. the role of a livery company in the 21st century? Uh, I think it, I think it definitely has a role. I, what I would come back to, I, I'll tell you in five words. And these are the five words that I used when I gave, you know, when you become a Freeman and a liveryman, at the end of the ceremony, the master gives you a little pep talk and you're standing at the back of the room and he says, I hope you're going to see you at lots of events and so on. And I said, I'm going to remind you of what I call the five C's. And those are the five great points of fellowship of a livery company. I got this from a Victorian book and they are charity, citizenship, commerce, comradeship, and conviviality. And I think that sums up pretty well what you might get out of the stationers, especially conviviality. But there's a lot of potential criticism of the city and uh, the livery movement in general, isn't there? Um, things that have remained in place for so long and now being criticized all over the place and um, we're part of it aren't we? We're a potential target. I think we are but I think we can hold our heads up and say that education which is the big outlet for our charitable giving has you know we've really put something into that at the Stationers Academy with the Hellenism's apprenticeships with the sponsoring of postgraduate universities. I mean, that is, a, that's something we can be proud of. And I think I would defend our role in that, certainly. And, you know, I think we, we support the Lord Mayor, that is part of the business. And that's part of, if you buy into the City of London, and the notion of the corporation, then that's part of being a stationer, for sure. I've got two questions here from Paul Pinder. First one is uh, about, um, John Walter the Elder, who um, had a um, sort of 
not altogether successful business career, did he? Um, and he came back, he bounced back. How did he bounce back? Why did he bounce back at a time when um, uh, debtors were um, thrown out of things very often? I think I know, well, he, he was essentially an entrepreneur. He ducked and dived. You know, he tried lots of different things. And when he lost all his money, he was a, involved in the coal trade. Then, of course, he put his money into Lloyd's and he lost practically everything with some hurricanes in Jamaica. He was called, his name was called in and he went broke. And he bounced back from that, I think, because he was very frank about it. He sold the house, he moved house, he sold his library, he did all he could to clear his debts. And his creditors were so impressed by this that in the end they said, okay, you know, we pay your debts off over time. And he did. And we will trust you and help you to get back on your feet. And that was when he was able to borrow the money to take out the patent on logography, the system of uh, typesetting, which he thought was going to revolutionize typesetting. It was setting type in bit, bit, wasn't it? And it didn't. But he was, yeah, you, it was instead of picking up one character, characters one by one, they were welded together. You know, so you might pick up V in one go. So in theory, that would be much quicker for composition. But it didn't work out very well like that, partly because the printers didn't like it. <laughs> so, so the time sort of started out as a demonstration for this printing process, didn't it? It, it was, was he wasn't a driven publisher, was he? I mean, he, was, he wanted to use it for book work, and he did publish books. It wasn't so much newspapers. I think maybe he just saw, I think maybe he saw a gap in the market and thought, I'll have a shot. And he was that sort of bloke, entrepreneurial. I would say a sort of buccaneering figure. And then his son was entrepreneurial around the business of publishing, of, of being a newspaper proprietor, wasn't he? Yes. And of, in my view, sort of setting the paper on a much sounder course. For example, he stopped taking government money to put stuff in the paper. He paid for his theatre tickets. This is all for the stuff the Independent did. You know, he paid for a theatre ticket. Um, he broke, the government had an embargo on uh, news coming in. You know, they wanted to pass the news on to the papers. John Walter hired a cutter and ran his own service across the channel. He actually hired a smuggler to bring news in during the war. And uh, he, he again, like his father, but, but he, was, uh, he was also a man, a much more principled man, and a sort of modest man. I mean, John Walter I spent two years in jail for libel. I mean, it wasn't really his fault, but unfortunately, it's the case of the proprietor is the one who carries the can. And so he found himself in Newgate Jail. Doesn't seem to happen these days. Uh, Paul also has a, um, um, a question about uh, something that's really interesting in the book that's sort of a side, uh, going all, all, along on the side of uh, uh, John Walter II, and that is all this social stuff and the smells. You have evocative chapter, I think, on the smells of London and uh, uh, the sort of context in which all this stuff was being produced every day, the newspaper. And um, what Paul wants to know is when the, the, the state of London started to improve. I suppose it was linked to the Great Stink, wasn't it? The Great Stink was certainly uh, the Great Stink of 1858, which drove the MPs out of the Palace of Westminster. Then they started to take it seriously. But there'd been a frightful cholera epidemic in 1832 that killed, oh, 5,000 people. And the reason for that was the poor people of London took all their water from the Thames. The Thames was an open sewer. Outfalls, the Fleet River just poured ordure into the Thames. And the Great Stink and Basil Jeff and his sewerage system did set out to improve that. And it did, it did slowly. There was another cholera epidemic. I mean, people, this is quite interesting uh, comparison with today. 
people were not quite sure how it spread. It was said to be miasma, bad air and so on. But once started, people started dying, I just looked down the tie and throat. Nobody knew if the hospitals were ready for this cholera. The Board of Health has done nothing to tell us about how to treat it. And it is, in short, a disgraceful piece of negligence. So even though the hospitals were not ready for the cholera, in the same way we were not ready for COVID. And but the, the filth in the streets, I mean, the problem there was the whole all <laughs> about horses because you see even when the streets started to be paved with granite sets or with wooden blocks as they then were later um, you would still got the horses and all the horse manure a good sized horse produces about 16 kilos of dung a day and that was going straight onto the street then you've got all the cattle for example being driven to Smithfield through the streets of London and of course, once it rained, the roads became impassable. And even as late as the 1860s, the London glue in the streets. Um, when they started asphalting streets, uh, horse owners complained that it made them slippery in the rain and the horses slipped over. So you really couldn't win until you got rid of the horses. And that was you know, very much later. In fact, in 1930, Regent, uh, Regent Street was relayed with wooden blocks. And you know, they were, you see them occasionally, wooden blocks with sort of creosote on top and tar and so on. The point of the attraction of those were they were much quieter than cobblestones. You can imagine these carts and horses thundering over stones and granite. The noise must have been prodigious. You've also got an enormous amount of air pollution because everyone's burning coal. And the roof line is so low that you know the smoke is coming down at a very low level. It's not going up. So it was a filthy place. It really was. There's also the link of um, Fleet Street itself with the uh, smell because the the uh, butchers at Smithfield tossed their offal into the open river Fleet yeah. just as um, uh, printing was coming along. Uh, then um, the cheapest lodgings were all along the River Fleet. And so indigent hacks, the writers, had their, um, their lodgings there because it was so stinky. And, and that's one of the reasons why Fleet Street is, uh, or until recently, has been what it is. Uh, I've got a question uh, just come in about uh, the Daily Telegraph. Up for sale now, but pretty bad timing, isn't it? Well, I, I don't know. The thing is, you would always have thought in the past, a property like that, there's going to be a rich man who wants it. But I, I just don't know now. I mean, the Times is well ahead of the Telegraph in circulation, in revenue. Um, I wouldn't say it's a hot property. On the other hand, it's a paper with a tremendous past and tradition and history. And it, it ought to be worth something to somebody, but they, they've not really gone into digital in a big way. They, they've got a lot of catching up to do, and it would be a very expensive investment. But the last question from Richard Gilpin. Um, John Walter was a great technology innovator, obviously. What would he make if he were to journey here in a time machine about Wapping, about Broxbourne? What I think he'd say that Wapping was a real game changer and the, the legacy of that lives on because the fundamental legacy, the journalists have control of the paper with direct input. I don't think it's going to be lost again. Broxbourne, well, I mean, those, those presses, as I say, they're still running. Um, that's still commercially viable, newsprinters. And uh, as long as people want contract printing, I think they'll keep going. I think Walter would have been very proud to see the presses of Boxbourne. I mean, he might have said, well, I got there first, actually. <laughs> Christopher, thank you very much. That's the book. Uh, I think you've given a very vivid impression of the various currents that eddy round in it, not just John Walter II himself, but uh, all the things that affected him and that he then affected. 
thank you very, very much for this slightly experimental but uh, rather interesting um, hour. Um, let's drink to the stationers. Thank that was so great. Much. That was absolutely great. Um, thank, thanks, thank, thanks, guys. Um, Peter, thank you for doing what you have always do so, so, so brilliantly. And Christopher, I cannot think of a better person to be the historian of, 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 of my favourite newspaper. And it's interesting, you were talk, we were talking about dear, dear late Brenda Dean because I joined the court on the same day as Brenda. And um, I must admit, I expected some fireworks between you and her as past adversaries, but both of you, um, as, a, as I guess I should have expected, behaved absolutely in a professional manner, worked together on projects, and both of you have, have been and used to are an asset to the court, so thank you. So as promised, there will be an opportunity to, to buy Christopher's fantastic book. Um, the price is £25 if you collect from the hall, or it's £30 for post and packaging. If you could email Lucy if you'd like a copy, and we can arrange if you'd like to get the book personally signed by Christopher, so any inscription you want inside, um, just again let Lucy know and then we will manage to get that book to you. Um, I'd welcome feedback on, on tonight's event and if you think it's worth us doing something like this again which would be which would be absolutely delighted to organize. <laughs> if you've missed any of it or you came in late um, then it's on our YouTube channel as well um, but it's been absolutely fascinating. The next one planned one although we're going to try to get one in the studio in between will be on the 10th of September with Margaret. And if you look at um, the blog Spitalfield's Life today, you'll see a fantastic um, uh, introduction to, to Margaret's book, which is absolutely fascinating. So everybody, all I can say is, is, is thank you again, Peter. Thank you, William, for organising. And most of all, Christopher, absolutely great tonight. Thank you very much. And thank you for sparing your time. Good night, everybody. It's been the greatest fun. Good night. Good night. Good night.